Today, I'm going to start with credit risk. And now, going forward, as I announced last week, we're going to be abandoning this idea that everybody works for free. And we will also abandon another idea, which is key to this, which is that people will do what they should do. Neither of those two assumptions will hold for the rest of the course. No one works for free, and some people, some companies will have to do something, and guess what? They may not do that. This is going to be the basic building block for what we're doing in this particular lecture today. And that's what's called portfolio credit risk. Okay, so <laughs> this is what we're doing, and this spans two weeks. In the first week, uh, which is today, we're going to be doing essentially this, just the basic framework for credit risk, what it is and what it does for us. And then next week, I will be doing what's called the commercial model, the actual applications. That's why you need to see that before you can do assignment number two, because assignment number two is going to be something very, very practical. You're going to be do, you're going to pick a company, and you're going to be doing the credit risk analysis of that company, and you will do it according to some of what we'll do today, but mostly based on what we will see next week, which are the advanced models that happen to be commercial. Hmm? Anyway, that's what we're doing in these two weeks. All right, and <clears throat> to understand credit risk well, there is an example that I want to walk you through. It's a very interesting example. It's an example that dates back to 1982. 1982. And, um, and it's, the, it's, a very, it's a fairly famous uh, Goodrich Robobank swap of 1983. Now, <laughs> let me explain to you what 19, 1983 was. <clears throat> Uh, let's put things into perspective. The 70s was the decade of the famous uh, Iran oil embargo by the U.S. Essentially, Iran and the U.S. were you know, at war with each other. Okay. You, know, you, you know that? Yes, you know that. Okay. <laughs> that created tremendous uh, economic problems for companies, they were always very dependent on oil, perhaps more than it is now. And that created tremendous fluctuations in the stock market, in the interest rate market, everywhere. And in 1982, all of this developed into a very deep recession. It was a recession of a very particular type. <clears throat> It's a recession with very high interest rates. <clears throat> Let me link that to what's happening now. Um, now we are going through a, a type of an energy crisis because of uh, the war in Ukraine and what that's doing uh, for the world. And COVID has created uh, a certain amount of inflation also. Okay, so um, interest rates, as you saw in your assignment number one, have been going up. What is the interest rate right now? Six point something. Six point something, there you go. Well, back then in 1982, it was about 10, 11%. And the recession was a much, it was a real recession, not like what we have now. People are talking about a recession, maybe we are technically in a recession, but it doesn't feel like a recession. And employment numbers are very low, and that's, that's not, not typical, typical of a recession. Of a recession. So it's a so very it's unusual a very unusual recession, recession that we're going through now, if indeed we're going through a recession. 1982 was, or 1983, was much more similar to 2008. So 2008, yes, the great, they call it the Great Recession. That was, uh, for, for a long time, in 2008, 
<coughs> people were comparing 2008 with 1982, see which one was worse. In the end, 2008 was worse than 1982, but it's the right comparison. The difference is interest rates in 2008 were about 1%. 1 and back here, interest rates were about 10, 11%, as we're going to see. Okay. So imagine a recession with very high interest rates. It's very bad. It's very bad for, well, for a lot of um, uh, sectors in the economy. It's very bad for the real estate market. Many people lost their homes. It was, it was just bad economically. Um, and today, the main character of what I want to explain to you was a company called Goodrich. You know the company called Goodrich? No? Okay, well, um, who, who is the, who is the, um, the main tire company now in the world? I mean, not Canadian Tire, but who is the... British Tire Company. Yeah, yeah, so, uh, so now is uh, Goodyear. Who, who is the big... I, I don't know much about cars. I don't know anything about cars. Okay, so Goodrich was... What? Still Goodrich. Still Goodrich. Still good, Rich? Okay, uh, they, they, their business has changed, and now they, are, they, they cater more to the uh, military. But back then, their main business was, was um, tires. Now they do, they do vinyl products, and they've diversified their business. But back then, what, did they, what they did is they did tires for cars and trucks, basically. Hmm? Now, in, in, a, in a situation where you have high recession, Sorry, recession uh, and and very high interest rates. We went through this, I think, uh, last week. I think I'm not sure. I think someone asked about Volkswagen. Um, you don't sell cars. Cars are just not being sold. So if the cars are not being sold, tires are not being sold. So Goodrich was a company that, on average, they had approximately thirty million dollars of the time of net earnings and the year 1982 they had negative 50 million dollars worth of net revenue okay they had losses 50 million dollars and they they wanted to finance that they needed to they needed 50 million dollars that was the situation but it's important to understand the, the context in which they needed that i want you to there's some thinking that we have to do today to understand the, the uh, situation back then. They needed $50 million. <clears throat> Turns out that because of the situation that was happening, their credit rating was just downgraded. We're going to see what the credit ratings mean, but for now, let me just tell you that they were uh, rated a triple B minus, which is at the borderline of being investment grade. That means that it was very hard for them to get uh, loans in the interest rate market. Hmm? Uh, $50 million looks like a very small amount of money today. In fact, in 2008, the amount that was a part of the emer emergency uh, package asked by Hank Paulson out of the US Congress was 85 billion with a B. This is million with an M. So let's ignore the size of the amount of money, 50 million, something that we are, uh, they are trying to raise. And what they found is something very interesting. Um, Solomon Brothers was their consultant. What they found is this. They had two options. They could go into the fixed rate market or, in, or into the floating rate market. And you know what that is, right? In the fixed rate market, they give you a quote. This is it. This is what you pay. And in their case, what they got as a um, as an offer was I forgot it, it they got I think it's eleven point eight. Then they got eleven point eight. Eleven point eight percent. That's what they got if they wanted a fixed rate loan. However, if they wanted a floating rate loan, they got LIBOR plus zero point five percent which is a labor was approximately, let's say it was at 10%. Okay. 
Okay, so it was a 1% differential. 1% differential amounts to about half a million dollars a year in extra financing costs. We're going to assume these numbers are relevant. Hmm? So that was interesting. They, what they wanted, they wanted a fixed rate loan. Why? Because they were concerned that if they get out of the recession and suddenly car sales start to go up, rates will be even higher. Right. So from their perspective, rates couldn't go any any lower than 11 percent. Therefore, they wanted a fixed rate loan. Okay. You understand the context? <clears throat> and they saw that the fixed rate loan it is what they wanted, but it was expensive. Does it happen to you when you go to buy something? What you want is the expensive stuff, and what you don't want is the cheap stuff. That was exactly their predicament. That's exactly what happened to them. And in this situation, they again, their consultant, uh, I think it was Solomon Brothers, had another client who had the exact opposite situation to Goodrich. Their situation was it was a it was a Dutch bank, Rabobank, and they were interested, AAA rating, the, the best credit quality you can think of. They essentially managed pension plan money, and they were looking to invest money that they, they sorry, they were not looking to invest. They were, they were going to get into the euro dollar market, and they were looking for floating rate exposure. Let's not get into what instruments they wanted to buy. They just wanted floating rate exposure. And for them, it didn't matter if they uh, did floating rates uh, or fixed rate, the price was the same. From a cost perspective, floating rate, fixed rate was the same because they have a very good rating. But they wanted floating rate. The reason is they manage pension money. And when you manage pension money, you want floating rate. Okay? Um, be it as it may, what Solomon saw is that they had two different counterparties, uh, one in uh, the Netherlands and one in the US, who had um, similar funding needs, but they wanted different things. And for one of them, the price difference was substantial, was 1.3%, I think, the differential. And for the other one, it was zero, essentially zero. Hmm? So what they did is they did something which was um, was a swap. Now everybody talks about swaps. We know swap, but this was one of the first swaps in history. That's why it's famous. It was one of the first swaps in history. And by the way, when people talk about the 80s being the decade of the swaps, now you see why. Because situations like this happened everywhere. Hmm? But we're not interested in the swap per se in this case. What we're interested in what we're interested in is what caused the swap and the credit aspects of this swap <clears throat> because of the following. The deal that was ultimately brokered by Solomon was as follows. There was a, there was a certain trust company, uh, Morgan Guarantee Trust, who would do the following thing. They negotiated... <coughs> um, two swaps with two counterparties. Let me start with Robobank. With Robobank, what they did is they say, I will give you $5.5 million every year. Happens to be 11% of 50 million. Okay? So that's 11% of 50 million. I give you $5.5 million every year, but you give me LIBOR on 50 million. Forget about the number Y for now, okay? Yeah. Forget about that for now. Forget about that. That's the swap. I give you 5.5, you give me 50. So if LIBOR is at 11%, I give you nothing, you give me nothing. But if LIBOR is less than 11%, then I give you money. And if LIBOR is more than 11%, then you give me money, okay? Understand? I'll explain to you why this was done. That's on the Robo Bank's right. On the Goodrich side, this is what happened to them. They told them, you know what? Go and buy what you don't want. Buy 
the, you know, take a loan at a floating rate. Then Goodrich says, but that's not what I want. I said, don't worry, just do as I say. Get a floating rate bond. And they got a floating rate loan from the US savings banks at uh, LIBOR plus 0.5%. Remember, this was the cheap option they had. So buy the cheap thing, LIBOR plus 50 basis points, okay? You know what you want, but don't worry because what I'm gonna do is to your loan, I'm going to add a swap. A swap, which is you give me a payment, which is fixed 11%, 5.5 million, and I give you LIBOR times 50 million. Okay? This gives Goodrich a hedge against what they didn't want. If interest rates go up, they'll have to, here they'll have to pay more, but they also get more from here. So this leg of the swap compensates their payments to their lenders. Okay? You see that? So then Guthrie says, oh, well, then this is good. I buy the cheap stuff, and then you give me this swap that turns the cheap stuff into the good stuff, which is what they wanted. Yeah? And for Robobank, say, so, well, get what you don't want. Oh, sorry, the Belgian dentist, that's it. That's the pension, OK? They run the pension for the Belgian. That's what that's there. So get into the, um, get into the fixed rate market, which is not what you want. But now I turn your fixed rate obligations and make them floating rate obligations. You see? So the swap to Robobank has the exact opposite effect. Robobank was indifferent, was price indifferent. So they get what they didn't want, not because it was cheaper, like in the case of Goodrich, but because um, they were encouraged to do that. And that's where the why comes in. So you get what you don't want, I'll make it worthwhile, which is that when you pay me, I give you a discount. That's where Robobank did this deal, okay? So now we, we need to understand why everybody did this deal. I want you to understand this. This is called financial engineering. Financial engineering is not um, doing the Black-Scholes formula. That's not it, that's something different. This is far more important. I want you to understand why everybody was happy with this deal. So we start with Robobank. Robobank was happy because they got the floating rate exposure that they wanted, but with a discount. So Robobank made Y percent on 50 million. Yeah? I'm not telling you what Y is. We'll, we'll work out the value of Y later. So I said, well, sure, I'll, I'll do that. You know, I do this transaction which I don't want. It doesn't cost me anything, but that's not what I want. But now this swap deal here turns it into what I want. That's what they did it. Goodrich did this deal because they got what they wanted at a discount too, because they got the cheap financing there. And then the swap made it, the, made, turned the cheap financing into fixed rate financing. And the cost is X. They had to received money at a discount. So it had a cost of them, which was equal to X. So for good rates, because they were saving 1.3% in this deal, as long as X is less than 1.3%, they will be making money. Are you following that? Yeah? Good. So good rates is making money as long as X is less than 1.3%. And how about the trust? How about my Morgan Guarantee Trust? The trust will make money as long as X is bigger than Y. Right? Because that means that the payments they get from Robobank don't exactly match the payments they make to Goodrich. They keep a portion of that. All right? This is how deals happen. This is financial engineering. Now we need to figure out what X and Y should be, and we got a deal. And this is what you negotiate. We already know that this 
three inequalities have to be satisfied for this deal to make sense for all three counterparties. X bigger than Y means, oh, and maybe another one, this less than 1.3%, right? So then uh, from, the, from the left of those inequalities, Goodrich makes money. X bigger than Y means that Morgan makes money, and Y bigger than zero means that Robobank makes money. Is that clear? Great, okay. So in this equation now, so you see, people now make money in the, we're in this part of the course. If it wasn't for that, this deal, you know, would be merely academic. But here people are making money, and that's what they do it. Yes? But the reason why Goodrich was not able to get this from the beginning was because they had bad credit. Yes. So how does this? Okay, so that your <laughs> you are um, advancing what my next question was going to be. So, my next, but I'm going to put it differently. Okay. So it looks like this is a good deal. Everybody likes this deal, right? Except who is the one who is at risk? There's one concept which will become very important for us two weeks from now when I talk about investments, which is you cannot make, you cannot have performance, you cannot make money unless you take risks, okay? Arbitrage doesn't exist, we already saw that. The efficient market hypothesis is pretty, although it was like an, an academic assumption for us, it's, it's, um, it's pretty reasonable, okay? It's pretty reasonable, so it's difficult to make money. In fact, you cannot make money unless you take risks, simple as that. So it looks like here we're breaking that notion because it looks like everybody's making money, right? Yeah. So uh, two comments on that. First, yes, everybody's making money because markets are not efficient. And I mentioned that when I exhibited the efficient market hypothesis. In efficient markets, yes, no one makes money, but in inefficient markets, you can make money, and this is what makes markets efficient. You, you do enough of these swaps, eventually, guess what? Interest rates would come down, and then Goodrich would get what they wanted at the right price. So this proves that Goodrich was getting a quote that was too expensive for what they wanted. That's what this diagram shows. That's number one. Number two is, of all of these characters here, uh, they're all making money. Who is taking the biggest risk? The person in the middle. Yeah, Morgan, the trust. The trust, why? Because of what you said. A AAA rating, Rob Bank is going to pay, no question. And, but Goodrich has very dodgy credit. And so it could default. And this is... Uh, the default probability or the default characteristics of Goodrich is what will determine the, the relationship between X and Y. Why? Because when you take risk, in this case credit risk, you have to be compensated. So if Morgan, if the trust is taking risk, the trust has to be compensated. And the compensation of the trust comes from the difference between X and Y. You see that? Okay, I, I want you to understand this deal. This, this is a deal which perhaps belongs in a course in corporate finance. By now you know that in this course I cover everything. I don't. This is a deal that I want you to understand. Good. So now all of this looks good, except we have a remaining question, which is what should the difference between X and Y be? And what's the relationship between that difference and the risk? credit risk that the trust is taking. That's why I like this swap very much because, well, first you learn a little bit about corporate finance and financial engineering and deal making and all of that. It puts the first half of this course into a different perspective, but also because it's a great way to introduce the concept of credit risk, credit trading, credit spreads and things like that. So I want to spend, I want to focus on the difference between X and Y now. I want to focus on the credit risk profile of this deal. The financial engineering we have done is incomplete. There's one thing we have not taken into consideration, 
which makes this deal into a wonderful deal. <clears throat> and it's as follows. I want to delete these annotations from the screen. And I want you to continue to think, okay? You need to think and answer. The people on Zoom, you think, don't answer, but just think, okay? Um, think. Let's look at the credit risk profile of this deal. What is bad for Morgan, for the trust? What is bad for the trust? That rates go up or down? What's bad for the trust? What is the trust afraid? Imagine you work for the trust. You're the financial engineer who did this deal, right? And you're going to get a bonus if this deal works very well and it goes through, I think it was an eight-year deal, or seven-year deal, or something like that. So at the end of those years, if everything is good and, and Goodrich uh, pays everything, and then you get, you get a bonus, right? What's your fear that will make you not get your bonus? You, Caltech. <laughs> You don't want 1.3% to go down, right? Well, you don't want LIBOR to go down. 1.3 was the spread, right? You want So LIBOR going down is what concerns you as the trust, right? Everybody sees that? Why? What happens if rates go up? Let's look at the good rates swap only. What happens when rates go up? You have to pay good rates, right? Let's say rates go further up, so less cars are sold, right? If, because it's difficult to get financing. So good rates say goes bankrupt because they can't sell a single tire. You have to give money to a bankrupt company, right? That's good. That's good. Because if you have to get money from a bankrupt company, you're not going to get it. You, you, you see? <clears throat> Some people, I don't know if any one of you thinks that the risk here is that this swap here costs you money. That's not the risk. Because whatever money this swap costs you, if it's offset by the other swap, then you're happy. The real risk is not that the swap costs you money. The, the real risk is that the swap is worth something and the company goes bankrupt. Because then you don't get it and you still have to pay good rates. Right? So this is important because it somehow signifies that credit risk and market risk go in opposite directions, right? You want to owe money to a bankrupt company. You don't want a bankrupt company to owe you money, right? Okay, good. So we got that. The risk here is that rates go down. But the thinking in Solomon Brothers is if the rates go down, What will happen to Goodrich? They'll sell tires. They'll sell tires. So they don't think Goodrich will default when rates go down. They will default when rates go up, not when they go down. Right? Yeah? And actually, this is why this is considered to be a good deal. So it is true what you said, that the risk profile for Morgan is substantial because of the good rich quality but the thinking was because of the type of swaps i have especially to the left the credit risk profile is not that big a deal i wouldn't say that you that this was an example of arbitrage but as long as x is bigger than y this deal is probably worth making okay Good. Okay, so we're done. I think we understand this very well. Hmm? 
And the question that remains is, yes, X should be bigger than Y. This is what Morgan wants, but what should that be? Should that be 1%? We know we have 1.3% to spread amongst all three parties. Should you do it 50, a third, a third, a third? Everybody gets 40 basis points, for example. Maybe that's a starting notion, right? We know Goodrich is very happy as long as this number is less than 1.3. So maybe, maybe Goodrich will pay more than 40 basis points for this. They can pay up to 100 basis points, right? So the pricing of this deal is the next step. And for that, I'm going to stop with the case and I'm going to start doing math. We're going to do the math that will ultimately give us what the pricing for this deal should be. OK? Understand? All right, good. So uh, all right. So in that case, I'm going to now um, um, move to something else. What I have now is, so that was from 1983. This is from, I actually don't know the year. I'm going to make a guess. 2007, I don't know. It's a very famous deal from Scotiabank and a supermarket in Chile. Jumbo was the name of the supermarket. Scotiabank, as you probably know, is a very big bank. They have a lot of business in Chile and in Colombia and in Peru and in Mexico. These are the four countries outside Canada where they have a lot of business. <coughs> and in that year, back in that year, when they were starting, they started with a very interesting business line, which was a business line of small credits, up to $300 credit, given to people at the time of checkout, when they go grocery shopping to Jumbo. They did a, a deal with Jumbo. Okay. The reason I'm, I want, there's a reason why I'm telling you about this deal. It's a different deal, it looks very different, but let me tell you. Um, so th the way this deal works is as follows. If you're, a, if, you're a, if you're in Chile and you go buy your groceries at the checkout time, what you do is you, you have the option to apply for a loan up to $300, not 50 million like before, $300. And the arrangement between the supermarket and Scotiabank was that within five seconds, the following thing has to happen. The person asks for the loan. The supermarket has the profile of this person, the equivalent of the uh, President's Choice uh, program that Loblos has here. You know that? Do you go grocery shopping? No? Yes? Do you have your, uh, um, your points card or something? Well, what, 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 why, why is there a points card? To give you discounts, is that the reason they a points card? No, it's to get information from you, okay? The points card is how supermarkets get information from you. Um, and in this case, there was some profiling of the, I don't know how advanced it was, that, I don't have access to that information, but the supermarket had their points card, so they knew who this client was that was applying for the loan. And when you apply for the loan, part of the profiling that they do is, I don't know if you have any one of these points cards, but they ask you for questions like, where do you live? What do you do? What's your income? And then what they don't ask you because they already know, they know everything you buy, how often, where do you buy it, and all of that stuff, right? So the database they have consists of five questions they ask you and several megabytes of information which they collect from you, right? So the deal was that the supermarket has that information and that information is shipped to the bank in some form. I don't know how it was shipped to the bank, whether it was in true form or in encrypted form. I don't know that. This is all very interesting. That's why I'm telling you this. Huh? And then the Bank of Nova Scotia will get that information and make a decision within five seconds whether to give that loan or not. Now, what goes into making that decision? 
the credit rating is not an issue. This is not 1983. This is not Goodrich. What is what goes into making that decision? First question is, are you lying? When you say you are a doctor making, you know, a million pesos per year, or whatever, then the right? And does that actually coincide with your shopping partner, where, where you say you live and where you go shopping, things like that? You do some checks, right? This is what big data does. This is data science, and you know about this. You could probably write Python code to, uh, to write you a, a, a flagging system which says, I believe you, I don't believe you, right? So let's, let's stay with that. Let's say that the point is to decide if you, if you believe or not the person applying for the loan, right? Five seconds, and then you say yes. The reason I'm telling you this is because whereas what I want to be doing in this two weeks, it's all related to the Goodrich case and all of the credit risk analysis we're going to be developing is from that perspective. I want you to know that the way credit risk is being done today is different. It's very different. It's very data rich, especially when it comes to retail credit. This is an example of retail credit. Now, a lot of what we're going to be seeing here has a version for retail credit, but I am not going to cover it. I am not going to do it here. I will do the foundation of credit risk, and there's a lack of time. And if, but I will tell you enough so that with the information you have and the data science you already know, you will be able to build that bridge on your own. Okay? So I want to give you enough elements of knowledge about credit risk so that you can make the bridge between credit risk and data science to have a good idea as to how retail credit works. Understand what I'm saying? So this is a dead end for me in this course. I'm not going to get into this. But it's something very, very important that I want you to be aware that this is how you do things these days. The assignment number two that you're going to do is the old-fashioned style. You're going to pick a company and you're going to do an analysis very similar to the one we've done or we will do with good rates, very similar to that, which is good. That's how you're going to learn the basic credit risk. But again, there's a, there's a modern version of that, which is with data science. And the way we calculate the expected default probabilities is different when you have data, when you don't have data, when you have ratings, or when you have only data, and things like that. Hmm? Um, a footnote, which is of interest, is um, actually, President's Choice. Uh, President's Choice, you know, you know about the, you know Loblaws, the supermarket? You know the Loblaw company? The Loblaw company has three big assets. One is the supermarket. The other one is Shoppers Drug Mart, the biggest pharmacy in Canada. And President's Choice Financial, a bank. It's a very interesting set of assets because you have the supermarket, the pharmacy, and the bank. Now, I'm not going to say anything. Um, I'm not going to issue any opinions about that triangle, but it's a very interesting triangle, don't you think? What's the supermarket there for? Yeah, I sell groceries, but that's not what I'm asking. You know, the, it's the easiest access to data, right? From a data perspective, the supermarket is the easiest access to data. I go shopping to Loblos. I have a points card. I actually have a credit card too. They know what I buy, when, and this and that, right? So they have a lot of data about me because of that. So that's that's very valuable. How about the pharmacy? What's the pharmacy good for? You get data as well. You get data, but now you get health data, which is very precious, right? Yeah. Uh, did I tell you? It's a very famous case at Walmart. Did I tell you Walmart case? 
when a few years ago, uh, it, it's been publicized, it's, it's everywhere. And um, uh, I don't know how it happened. I, ca I can tell you how it's been written, you know, which is a, <coughs> there was a, a the, the story involves a father and his daughter. The daughter was a teenager, very young, and the father saw that Walmart was selling flyers to his daughter with a lot of um, uh, baby products in it. And the father was very upset and went to the store, said, why are you guys doing this? He said, you're trying to get my daughter, you're trying to encourage my daughter to get pregnant. The interesting part is that she was pregnant. He didn't know. And this is interesting. And it's, this is old. This is like years, years old, right? This is one of the early um, uh, uh, examples of how data collection can get you very much information. You should know that pregnancies is uh, for retailers is a gold mine, okay? Tremendous uh, uh, price elasticity. It's just, you know, they, they really want to know that. Um, they don't care if you're a math professor, they care if you're pregnant. That's what they care, right? So anyway, so <clears throat> this is how these things that we're talking in these two weeks manifest themselves today, okay? And to finish my story about President Church, then there's the bank. What does the bank do to all of this? I would say, I don't know for a fact, although I, I, I know a lot of people working there. I suspect that's the way to monetize your information. That would be my guess, but I don't know. I should say that um, I'm very happy that a student in this course, I think two years ago, works now at the data science uh, at Loblos. You can find her on LinkedIn. She's one of my connections, I think. Uh, I don't know if you do a search. I, I'm trying to keep my LinkedIn profile very well organized with all of my clusters of students. And I have tried for years to have an APM 466 MAT 1856 group. Because then things like this should be very easy to find out, right? You just go to the group and say, who's at Loblos? Oh, she's at Loblos. And then connect with her and talk to her, okay? I'm sure that she's doing something very, very interesting. Um, I mean, maybe she has a, you know, nine to five job just collecting. I have no idea. I don't know what she's doing, but I've been talking about law laws and precedent stories and this and that. I happen to know that they're building a big data group in, in Brampton because they reached out to me and they were looking for students to, to hire. So when you apply for jobs, don't forget to apply for law laws. Okay. It, um, not not to be at the checkout counter. Well, maybe you know, maybe you want to do that. I mean, I, uh, maybe some of you have already had that job. You know, I, I know many many younger students who who did that. You know, but this is where some of the interesting things are happening. And this case with the Bank of Nova Scotia is very interesting. All right. Okay. So again, this is uh, I'm not going to cover this in this course. Uh, it just will feel too weird. It's 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 98% data science. So. You are taking already a lot of courses in data science. Today I'll give you what you need to know about credit so that you can build that bridge on your own. It's not hard. Okay? All right, so that's my introduction to the lecture, actually to these two weeks of lecturing on credit risk. I hope this was useful in putting this into the right mindset. Are you, yes, you understand what we're about to do? Now we just need to quantify things as we always do, come up with equations so we understand what's going on. The math will be very different. It's not something which is going to be as clean as we've done in the past. It's going to be a little bit dirty. It's the best we can do. Okay? All right. So, review of basic concepts. I'm going to start with the same way I started when we introduced the bond, with the cash flow valuation formula. I remind you, we saw this formula months ago. Months ago, right? I don't know your reaction when you saw this formula for the first time, but this is how we value 
payments that will happen in the future, that's my yield curve, and that's the time at which the payment will happen. This is what you did in your assignment number one. This is something which you are experts on this. You really are experts on this. You know more than 90% of the people out there about this. Yeah? You know how to calculate R, you know all of that stuff. Great. But here we made an assumption. We made an assumption which is that these payments will happen with probability one. That's how we derive this. Right? What will happen if we now question the probability at which these payments or with which these payments will happen? What if you question this probability? How shall we modify this? Any guess? We multiply by the probability. So if the probability, I call it Q, is a number which is between 0 and 1, the probability that this event will, that this payment will happen at that time, then that will be the valuation formula for it, don't you think? Anybody has any criticism on this thinking? Didn't we learn that pricing using probabilities was dangerous? Remember that? Am I doing the same thing that I did with a 50% chance of my... Am I doing... I cannot speak. I think you're saying something interesting. You have to speak loud. Because in the other case, you could train the underlines. So you could create a replicating portfolio, but not you can. All right, all right. You have a point. You have a point, right? In the other case, so let, let me let me. Um, so what you're saying is true, but I'm going to put it differently. I'm going to say, when we're doing this, I forgot who I was. Who, who did I play this game with? I already forgot. Who played that game? There were two games that we played. One was with a 50-50, and there was, it was just a coin flip. There was no asset. And the other one was, did I play the game with you when the coin flip? It? Zach, that was, that was, you were the one where we had the asset, right? And then Daniel, you were the one, no. Were, were you? I don't know. So which one is this? Is, the, is this the coin flipping, or is the option pricing, the call option? Which one is this? Which one is this? It'll matter, right? So for now, I'm not going to worry because I'm not going to say where this probability comes from. I'm just going to say that if I can, if I can, I'm going to take this probability to be the risk neutral probability. In other words, if it can be replicated, I will take that probability. And if not, I'll take what I can. It is a big change from the way we were arguing in the first part of the course, right? I'm saying, I don't know. Uh, let me just continue. We don't know. We'll solve this later. But I just want to flag to you that by introducing probabilities, we may be making a mistake. We'll come back to that. But now we know how to fix it. We know how to fix it, which is that if I introduce probabilities, I have to make sure that they are risk neutral or as close as possible to risk neutral, and then I'm okay. All right, okay, so I'm going to take this as true. And this has two, two, two aspects. On the one hand, if, if uh, the probability is low, that means that the valuation is low. However, if the valuation is fixed and the probability is low, that means that the payments will have to increase. Which is what happens like when you, when you have, for example, a mortgage, right? In mor your mortgage, the value of the mortgage is given. And you have low credit, you'll have to pay more. Right? Okay, great. So at least this equation satisfies that intuition about the relationship between credit and the payments or the valuation of this instrument. Good. But now let me be a mathematician. I don't know what Q is. I don't know. I don't know Q. I don't know the probability of default. Actually, this is probability of solvency, right? We're going to assume that if you don't pay, then you default. It's not that you don't pay because you don't want to, right? The only opportunity for you to not pay something is if you go bankrupt. It's the only one. 
Otherwise, you're going to be pursued and you have to pay. Thus, it works in practice, right? Either go bankrupt or you pay. There's no other choice. <coughs> so, because this probability is not bigger than one, I can use it to define a number h in the exponent of that. Either this is the definition or, perhaps more interesting than that, is what q satisfies. So, q is going to be the exponential of a certain h, h is called, is called hazard. This, is, this was called a hazard rate. The probability of solvency is a number, and then hazard rate is, the, is well, is just that. It's the logarithm of q divided by negative of time. Why am I doing that? Well, I'm doing that because, look at this. If I define q that way, then the valuation formula is this. I can absorb the Q into the exponent using the process H. I didn't know Q, I don't know H, but now this formula has a very interesting shape, don't you think? Which is what we observe. If your credit is bad, your interest rates are higher. That's what happened to Goodrich. So we like this perspective more than the probability of solvency. And that already introduces a one-to-one -one -one map expressed by this equation here of the relationship between the spread or the increased interest payments you will have, like it happened to Goodrich, and the probability that you're solvent or default or something like that. All good? Yeah? Is this too easy? Am I going too fast? Going too slow? All good. I don't want to lose anybody. What are you saying? Mm, what does that mean? Speak up. So, okay, Goldilocks. Just, just right. Yeah. All right. Good. Otherwise, let me. I, I cannot lose anybody here. Okay. This is something good. It's very easy, but you need to understand. I don't know how. How much of this you already know? I don't know. I don't want to lose anybody here. Okay. Because then we're beginning to climb a mountain, and as usual, you know, at the beginning it's easy. Let's just climb together, you know. When we get to the top, yes, okay, that's okay. You can. All right, good. Uh, that's great. So you're with me on this. This this formula now starts to sound interesting. No. Well, let me go beyond, and we can already do things with this. We haven't done anything yet, and yet we can already do things in these two weeks. I'm going to include a lot of questions from two exams, which some people take, the FRM and the PRM. FRM stands for Financial Risk Manager. It's, a, um, it's an exam done by uh, the Global Association of Risk Professionals, GARP. Okay. I was very involved with that association when they started many years ago. I was actually very involved in helping people prepare for the FRM many years ago. There's another one, which is the PRN, the Professional Risk Manager Certification or something, which is done by Premia, the Professional Risk Management International Association. I was also very involved with them early on, and I was also very involved in training people to uh, take those um, exams. And as you know, now I have my own certification, the FIT, okay? which is a bit more technologically involved. And these are uh, a bit dated, in my opinion. Um, but uh, this is, a, this is a, an exam for um, one of them. I forgot which one. I don't know. I think the PRM. I think it's the PRM. But uh, we can all do things. If I give you, I mean, we haven't described, we haven't explained what the credit ratings are, but it doesn't matter. I mean, I, I think you already know enough about this, enough to understand this, this, this question. And this is what this uh, exercise says. If I have a, a bond, senior and secure, blah, 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 we're not getting into that, matures in five years, and pays an annual coupon of 6%, it says, um, uh, what I give here is the one year forward zero curves. Right? That means that for the AAA, this is the rates that they will pay, and as you can see, the rates are higher as the credit quality is lower. That's what you expect, right? Yeah? So at least this, this is what we expect it to be. Where this matrix comes from or what does it do for us, I'm not getting into that. Not yet. Okay, right now it's part of the, uh, the problem and now the question is, 
The question here is, with this information, can you calculate the one-year forward price of the bond if the obligor stays at double B? So that's a question we can already solve because we just use the rates of that particular obligor and discount the bond cash flows according to these formulas. We are the only ones who use continuous time discounting. Most people out there use uh, annual compounding. That's why it's done like that, all right? And that's the answer, 102, blah, blah, blah. I haven't done anything, we can already start to solve some problems. I have to say, if you're taking any one of those exams, not mine, mine is a bit more advanced, but if you're taking any one of these exams, then this simple stuff is all you would probably need. You don't go very deep into any one of these topics, okay? The PRM goes a little bit deeper than the FRM, I think, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Okay? All right, so that's just an, that's just an aside. And now I'm gonna continue and I'm gonna do a little bit more uh, thinking. I already made the relationship between the probability of solvency and this hazard rate. Okay? Great. Let me introduce now, it's a Markov model. It's a very simple model for default. And the model is as follows. Um, at constant increments of time, let's say a year, every year, you have a certain probability of being solvent. Okay? And that probability, let's assume that it doesn't change over time. So if, say, you are the probability that you, will stay, that you will be solvent next year is 98%, 2% probability of default, right? What's the probability you will be solvent in two years? Assuming it, it, it's the same. Well, it is Q squared because it's as if I flip two coins, not 50-50, right? I flip a coin which is 98% and 2%. What's the probability I flip heads on a coin, say 98%? I have probability I flip coin, uh, heads twice, will be 98% squared, right? It's a Bernoulli process, the probability is taking powers of that particular event. You, you see that? Yeah? You, you know that, right? Yeah, yeah, okay, good. All right, so that means that assuming that, assuming the probability of solvency stays the same, your income doesn't go up, doesn't go down, you don't find a new job, you stay the way you are, right? Then the probability will be, uh, will, will propagate through time like that. At every point in time, where you have a, say, pick a, pick a fixed amount of time, I pick a year, so it'll be the probability of solvency in a year raised to a power. And by the way, that power could be an integer or fractional. What's the probability you're solving, say, six months from now? will be the square root of the probability you're solving in a year, right? Yeah? Good. So, in, but we're introducing a model here. The model here we're introducing is that you can be solvent or uh, bankrupt, only that, but the probability of going from one to the other is the same over time. That's the assumption we're making. It's a big assumption. It's a big assumption. But under that big assumption, what we see is that the probability of solvency is very simple, is the fixed annual probability raised to a power. Right? Yeah? Good. So from that perspective, then the credit spread, which was the, lo the logarithm of Q divided by time, is constant. Hmm. Hmm. Is that interesting? It's very interesting. It's very interesting. You see why? It's very interesting. Um, let me express that differently. <clears throat> what I described earlier is exactly the same. Exactly the same as to say that the credit quality or the probability of solvency is given by a two state Markov process. Have you all seen Markov chains? I'm not going to say Markov processes. You've seen Markov chains, discrete Markov chains with a fi finite number of individual states. You've seen that, right? 
Great. So what I'm saying is that for a two-state two state mark of change, if that describes my credit quality, then the credit spread is constant for that. Okay? Great. So this was not a lot of effort, but we can already do wonderful things with this. We can already do wonderful things with this. Let me do an application to what's called country risk or sovereign risk. Um, it's an application. The application I want you to make, I want to make it a little bit um, realistic. Actually, before I do this, let me, let me make it unrealistic. Let's say that I uh, pick a country that uh, could uh, default. Uh, actually, last year I was teaching this course just um, uh, after the um, Ukraine invasion. And I had everybody look at the um, Russian bonds because then that'll give you the probability of default of, the, of, uh, of Russia at that time. It's, a, it's an exercise we did last year. It was very timely, very timely. Uh, but let, 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 me, let, me, no, let me change. I actually haven't looked at the Russian bonds for a long time now. But let me pick a country. Let's say that you have a certain country. <clears throat> actually, I wonder, hmm, I just had an idea. Uh, what happens if you look at the UK? I don't know. It would be interesting. I haven't, I haven't done it. I'm just improvising that. But let's pick a country that has a credit spread of 2%. That means that they pay 2% more interest than another country that you can compare with. I'll have to give you some more details about this. What would be the probability of default of that country if the credit spread is 2%? I'll bring you back to the previous slide. What's the probability of default of that country in a year if the credit spread is 2%? If H is 2%, that's what I'm saying, right? H is 2%. What's Q? Each of the negative 2%. Which happens to be, apply Taylor's theorem. Taylor's theorem applied to the exponential. The exponential is like 1 plus x, right? So through Taylor's approximation, what would be the probability of default of that country? 2%. 2%. So by Taylor's theorem, the probability of default is the same as your credit spread. This was like zero effort, right? Or was it, or no? Was it? I didn't spell this out, it's too easy. I'm gonna do something a bit more challenging, a, more, a bit more real. I'll tell you why this is not real. But if that was the case, that would be the probability of default. I mean, it's very easy, right? And then if you look at the Russian bond and the, the, the spread is 7%, probability of default is 7%. Right? Of course, the Taylor approximation will break down if the spread is very big. Then you have to take the exponential. But without taking the exponential, it's almost linear. So the probability of default of a country is given by the credit spread. So there, there's, there's two things uh, that present an obstacle for this. One is when you compare, you compare uh, the uh, interest, interest rate, rate of a country, the country. Uh, when I say the credit, credit, sorry, the credit, credit spread implies spread that I have a risk-free risk rate of return. return. So, what, so what's the risk-free? The risk-free risk is here, right? right? Let's say I do this for, for the UK. Let's say I find out how much the UK has to pay in addition to the risk-free rate for their bonds. Well, what that R B? I mean, that would be the sub, that would be the, the interest rate of the Bank of England, but that's exactly what I'm looking for. So by definition, for every country, H is zero, right? So you can't do that. You have to compare that with, say, another country. But when you compare to another country, then you have the issue that they have different currency. And the currency could be the source of that differential. So although this is nice, the applicability is a little bit limited because you don't know what to compare it with. Okay? 
But you can say that if nothing has, has changed, the exchange rate is more or less the same with another currency, and now you suddenly pay more, that means your priority of default is perceived by the market to be higher. Right? Are you, are you following this logic? Yeah. All of this is not new. We've seen it before. We're applying what we've learned in the first half of this course to now the, the credit market. And let me ask you a question, and this is the important question. Um, if this was true, if that relationship is exactly like that, 2% priority of default because the bonds uh, have a 2% um, uh, yield spread, that probability is that risk neutral or real world? I'm putting your knowledge to the test. You, you know the answer to this already. Is that risk neutral or real world? These probabilities we're finding by doing these calculations, what are they going to be? Risk neutral. Risk neutral. Great, that's the one we wanted. Right? We already said that with, risk, with real world, we're not sure we're doing the right thing. If they were risk neutral, then we know we're doing the right thing because they can be replicated. That was the issue. I think you said that, right? Oh, you said that, right? Exactly, you said that, yeah, yeah. Well, they are risk neutral because there's a bond that gives them to me. So I can replicate them through the bond. That means that these probabilities could be replicated by trading bonds. Okay, now, um, let me, this is very cool, and this is not hard. We've learned everything we needed to actually do what we're doing. Okay, we can, you can make a five minute segment on CNN with this, explaining to people how a certain country has a priority of default because their bonds do something. People don't know this, but now you know that. This is a very simple relationship, right? It's all, is what we've learned here. We're gonna get very sophisticated in these two weeks. But at this level, this is something that you can explain to your grandmother, no? Yeah, no, you can, you can. All right, in fact, I, I, I like to do this. I, this, this. There was a perfect application of this in Europe, because in Europe we have different countries with the same currency. It's the, one, it's the only situation I know where you have different current countries with the same currency, so you can compare their yields. And then the difference is exactly what we're talking about. It's exactly the perceived increased uh, default probability of, say, Italy, Spain, Portugal, compared to Germany or Netherlands, who have zero. You see? Let's try that. Now, before we try that, we have to make the problem more interesting and also more real, which is, <coughs> um, let me criticize the formula I had here. According to this formula, this formula, I want to criticize it a little bit. This formula says that if I'm, if I'm bankrupt, you get nothing. Is that true? No. Who, who remembers some bankruptcies, some well-known bankruptcies? My favorite one is Argentina. I think it's the country that defaults the most, I think. They default every so often. Okay. What happens when a country like Argentina defaults? Do they just not pay? What they do is they renegotiate the debt. You say, well, you know, um, I'm not gonna pay. These bonds you have, I'm not gonna pay. I'm gonna default, so I'm gonna give you new bonds. And guess what, the new bonds, you're gonna lose 20%. But you keep 80%, right? <clears throat> With most bankruptcies, it's like that. Let's see, a recent bankruptcy. Um, Hertz was a bankruptcy a few years ago, right? I actually don't know what happened to that one, no. So I, I don't have a good example of a bankruptcy. But a bankruptcy means I'm not gonna pay those bonds. Either the company ceases to exist or a new company is created and then they give you new bonds at a discount. So you end up having what's called a recovery of those bonds, a recovery rate. You typically don't lose 100% of your value. Okay, you lose a piece of that. So that recovery is important when you're dealing with countries because countries, they, they never like not pay anything. I don't know a country where they just don't pay anything. 
that means that no one is going to lend the money ever again, and countries need money, right? So uh, because of that, if I'm going to take this very simple thing we just developed, and I want to make it real, if I want to do that, I have to introduce the concept of recovery rate. So <clears throat> back to this. Uh, I'm going to assume a recovery rate of 50%. I mean, in fact, I'm, I'm going to call it R. But so you think about it, 50% of what you're owed, you're going to get back. In the corporate world, 50% is the mean. That's where 50% is often used. Some companies, uh, they go bankrupt and creditors collect nothing. Others, they collect 80% or something like that. Hmm? <clears throat> I'll give you an example. I lived through this. Um, I don't know if you know a company called Blockbuster. Blockbusters? Have you heard of that company? Yeah? You haven't? That means you're very young. <laughs> okay. So um, in 2005, 2005? Yeah. Uh, 2000, uh, maybe 2002. 2002. Okay. 2002, if you wanted to watch a movie, either go to cable or you take your car to your nearest. Uh, you walk to the nearest um, DVD store, and they were all blockbuster stores. Okay, you go there, and you physically had thousands of uh, of um, uh, DVDs, and then you collect the one you want, and then you take it home. Okay, if you go in 2001, maybe there were also VHS tapes. Maybe there were tapes. I don't know. I forgot when the tapes came up. But you actually had to go to a store, and then you get those. And they were everywhere. They had, I don't know what market share in the, in the video watching business. 90%, 95%, it was almost a monopoly. And um, a, a tiny company was starting to develop a new business model. A company was called Netflix. And they said, I don't think this is a good idea. You know how Netflix started? Do you know? They actually decided the same way, except you didn't have to go to the uh, video store. They send you the DVDs home on a package. And you had a week to watch them and return them. <clears throat> that was what they did before they went online. When streaming became what it is now, or not even as good. But then they started to stream, and then you could, you could stream. But at first there was, and the key difference between the two of them was that um, a blockbuster charged late fees. Late fees was, actually I think 40% of the revenue was late fees. Late fees means you have a day to watch the DVD, then you have to return it tomorrow. If not, they charge you a dollar a day, or something like that. This is important what I'm telling you, you will see why. So um, that was so that was the business model of a blockbuster. You can decide if it was bad or, or good. But there's one thing they did to the business that was bad. Is what killed them, which is that they wanted to own their own stores. They actually wanted to own the building. So they had issued massive amounts of debt to buy real estate everywhere. <clears throat> this is not uncommon. Many companies they they do that. The, um, I think, uh, have you heard of Nobu, the restaurant? Nobu? I think that's what they do. They, they put a restaurant in it, but they buy the building first, right? And then the value of the building goes through the roof because they are there. Something that happens very often. A Rockefeller, head of Rockefeller, what I heard he did, he, he, he built the University of Chicago, right? So he had a big plot of land, he took the center, he said, well, this is for you, I give it to you, a university, a donation. So then by doing that, the whole value of, the, of your neighborhood goes, right? So this is a, it's a real estate deal. It just happens. It's called land development. This is what happens. So <clears throat> Blockbuster did that, but in 2008, they got killed. That, that was terrible. And in, um, we had them in our portfolio as a short bond. It was one of the strangest traits I've ever seen. Um, <clears throat> I want you to know this, okay? This, this is very relevant to what I'm talking about, and it's real. Um, we were short blockbuster bonds when they were worth 10 cents. 10 cents. I don't know if you understand what that means. <laughs> you have a bond which is worth a dollar. 
the bonds was 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 bankrupt already. The company was bankrupt and it was trading at ten cents, and we were still short. <laughs> My portfolio manager said, "Oh, it's going to go to zero. This is a zero, and it was a zero. There was like no recovery, nothing, nothing. Their their credit profile was so bad there was no recovery, or maybe a cent, or not even. I think nothing. <clears throat> That's rare." Usually there's some recovery, you know, you have a company, well, they, someone take your trucks or your airplanes, whatever you have, and then they sell them. And <clears throat> Air Canada, I think, was rescued a bankruptcy by Cerberus, a hedge fund. And when that happens, oh, nice. then same thing, you have some bonds, so, well, you know what, I'm going to restructure, how about I pay you 80% in these new bonds? And you typically say yes, because you typically don't have much of a choice. That's where a bankruptcy is, right? Um, anyway, so... <clears throat> That's why I'm introducing that recovery rate. That's why I say it's 50%, so you think about it, but it'll change very much. If it's a country, very different from if it's a company. And companies, of course, they're not all the same. So, do you understand what I'm saying? All of this is going to be formalized very much next week. Next week, all of this will be part of the credit risk formalism. Right now, I'm doing things one piece at a time because I want you to develop the intuition before I give you this formal framework in which everything works. But then if you don't know where it's coming from, you may think it's all magic. It's not magic. This is how things are done. So let's now think you have a country with a certain recovery rate and a certain spread. What's the probability of default of that country? That's the question I'm asking. Understand? If it wasn't for that, then we already know. Take the exponential and that you're done. But if you have a recovery rate, what do you have to do? Well. What you have to do is you have to change the valuation equation. It's here. <coughs> the company um, either does not default with probability Q, or it defaults with probability 1 minus Q, but then you get the recovery rate of what you're owed, right? That's the valuation equation. I changed it so I can take into account the recovery rate. Well, so this equation I just solved. Because the value of my bond now is that, with the H to the recovery rate, that means they have a formula for the spread as a function of the interest rate, or the hazard, well, the credit spread. The probability of solvency is a function of the credit spread with the recovery rate built into it. Hmm? You can still tell, tailor approximate that, but you don't get anything nice, so I haven't done it. But this is, isn't that incredible? We have a relationship between something we observe every day, which is the interest rate countries pay, and the probability of default. By the way, same thing for companies. Now we're getting closer to your assignment number two. Go back to the website where you got the data from for your assignment number one. Go back. Remember there were some companies there? There were some company bonds, corporate bonds, right? You have the TD bond, Bank of Nova Scotia bond, Transalta, the gas company bond, um, Bell Canada, they all have bonds, right? So you can go there and you can get the default probabilities of these companies. Province of Ontario, province of Manitoba, they all have bonds. So you can get the diff Isn't that wonderful? And it, we haven't even started the climb yet. Yes? But how do you know the R for each of these? You don't. You don't. Not today. It will, the R will, come to, will be given to us next week when we do something fantastic. It's due to Merton. Merton did this, we'll see that next week. But for now, when people they say, well, recovery rate, you know, you look at historical recovery rates, that's what they do, okay? Governments, 80%, 90%, 80%, okay? Then that gives you, the whether it's 80 or 90% probably does not have a lot of impact, okay, probably doesn't, uh, but you can do that. Um, and you can look at what we did last year, uh, look at Russia, and look at the default probability of Russia. You can see that over time. And that's what the market thinks. It's not a real probability of default. No one knows the real. It's the risk neutral. 
right? Which is the one which is useful to us. And it all comes from this formula. Oh, uh, yes? Great, okay, 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 good, good. Um, all right, today I'm gonna stay the whole class like this. I wanna give you um, little bites, okay? And then next week, then we're gonna start building a more formal, formal framework for all of that. But I want you to understand these little bites because then we're ready from the intuition perspective to do what we will do next week. Hmm? By the way, if you are ever have to build that bridge with retail credit, this is very useful too. So I'll continue. I like this way of introducing things a little bit at a time. And this is something which is, um, I did this in 2012. That was the, I mean, I'm not sure if you remember this. Uh, this for you, this is in the history books. I don't know if you, if you lived through this, but do you remember this event called Grexit? Grexit. Do you remember that? Grexit with a G. That was when Europe was talking about Greece possibly leaving the European Union. And the reason was <laughs> the credit spreads between many countries was, um, was very large and, um, and Greece was the biggest and was feared that they either would leave or they would be kicked out of the, of the European Union. Nothing happened, nothing happened. The one to leave was a different country. That's a, that's a, a whole other story, which is fantastic, fantastic. Anyway, so you look, uh, I don't know why I did this calculation one day, but uh, so from that perspective, what I have here is, this is something which is, is real. I did it in, in the, 2012 was the year where this was very hot, very hot. I haven't updated these numbers. Now they're not interesting, but in 2012, they were very interesting because the spread of each of these countries translates into a probability of default with, I don't know what probability, what a recovery rate I took. Maybe I took 50, I, I don't know what I did, but you can do this yourselves, right? If you don't like my R, change it, and then you get a different number. Yeah? You can do that. And in this case, as I said, because it's the same currency, you just take the best credit, which is the lowest interest rate, from the government-issued bonds, and then you just do the comparison. It's fantastic. Fantastic. Hmm? But now you can go you know, pick your region where the, the, the currencies more or less move together, right? Uh, where interest rates are more or less the same, and then you can still do the comparison. It's not exact though. We don't have a theory for that, not yet. Okay, well, let's continue. Now, <coughs> the problem with this is that we made an assumption. We had a two-state Markov chain model, where, which, is, which is not significant, right? Who doesn't get better or worse in their credit history? Who, who stays the same? No one stays the same. So, so to make that make model, model more realistic, realistic either, either you have two choices. Either you make the probability of default not be constant over time to allow for corporations or counterparties to get better or worse, or, which is what Merton will do next week, or you assume there is more than two states, N, eight. Eight is the number we'll pick here in this course, eight. And then you have an eight state Markov chain. You already know a Markov chain, you told me that. So what stops us from going from two to eight? The math is the same. Instead of a matrix which is two by two, it's now eight by eight. And the way that matrix works is I have here the probabilities of going from one state to the other. Who does not know a Markov chain? Who has never seen a Markov chain? Please be truthful, raise your hand. There is no benefit in line on this one. Who has not seen the Markov chain? You've all seen Markov chain. Yeah? Let me see in the chat. This is an important, important piece of information about you guys. Oh my goodness, there's questions here. Yuja, why should the events be independent? What? This is a question that was asked half an hour ago. Yuja, I don't know what you're asking. I'm sorry. I, I didn't see the chat as I'm lecturing about defaulting, what defaulting? Consecutive default. Oh, no, 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 no. No, no, they're not independent. They're identically distributed. Uh, oh, so, so, okay, so I'm addressing a question in the chat. I think you have it there. Um, they should be related somewhere. Yes, well, what happens is this. Um, for you to default in two years, 
sorry, sorry, sorry. For you to be solvent in two years, you need to be solvent in year one and in year two. That's why I take the square. Because there's no such thing as I default in year one and then I don't default in, and then I still solve it until year two. No, you default, you default, you default forever. A default is permanent, by the way. When you default, you don't recover. All right, um, there's a legal reason for that. Okay, okay, yeah, so that, uh, yeah, sorry about that. I, uh, so I don't, as you can see, I don't watch the chat as I'm lecturing, uh, but if someone does, uh, well, I, I do what you want. I'm coming to you, I just wanna get rid of this. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So just a stupid question. So there are no stupid questions. Each of the states on the Markov chain, would they represent the range on the recovery rates, basically? No. no. Um, here, we're going to... Okay. This is the way we're going to build. We're going to build the credit. So I'll give you a preview of next week, because our question is really about next week. It's about the framework, what we'll do. There's going to be two frameworks we'll, we'll discuss next week. One is the Markov chain, framework, which is this, which will have the credit default or events on the one hand, and then the recovery, the recovery on a different one, and the market value on a different one. So it's going to be three, a three-factor model. One is credit, one is recovery, and one is market. And that's one approach. The second approach we will do takes everything into account in one model. That's what Merton did. And he's gonna take recovery and credit and market all under the same one. It's fantastic. It's fantastic. It's absolutely fantastic, okay? And that's the one that you have to implement in your assignment, assignment number two. And this is what I will do next week. Yeah, I'll, 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 once I finish this, I can answer your question better. And I can answer your question best at the end of next week because then you would have seen everything, right? We're slowly converging towards that, slowly. Now I'm making my Markov state, my Markov chain higher dimensional. Why? Because I have now at least a way of saying, well, you graduated from university, now you're less likely to default. Oh, now you have a mortgage, you're more likely to default, right? You can, I can track you and give you a credit rating as time goes by. All right. And this is what this is going to do for us. It's going to give us a framework to, um, to, um, to, actually, shall we take a break? Do you want a break before we go high dimensional? Sure. It's a good idea to take a break before you go high dimensional, right? Okay, let's take a 15 minute break and then we go high dimensional. We saw, that with very little effort, we could have a very sensible credit model with a two-state Markov chain describing the credit quality of a counterparty. So what will happen if we make it higher dimensional? As you will see, it's exactly the same. It's not, it's not any more difficult. <clears throat> The calibration may be an issue, but it's, it, it's, it's not, not any more difficult. So we're going to now present the uh, Markov chain as a higher dimensional object. We have eight possible states. I'm going to say N8, you will see why. And we can go from, uh, from one to the other with a certain transition probability, which we organize in the transition probability matrix of the Markov chain. You've all seen that. I give you a chance to say no. So you didn't say no, so I assume you all know this. Which means that we now recognize that what the credit rating agencies do is they sell you a Markov chain. That's what they do. Hmm? Now, um, they do a bit more than that. We will see next week when we discuss the commercial models, what they actually do. But let me pause here, because I need to say something important about credit rating agencies. I could say they give me a credit rating and off we go, and then class is dismissed and we go home. But there's more than that, much, much more than that. I want you to understand the business model of credit rating agencies, see why. First, 
credit rating agencies, S&P, Moody's, Fitch Ratings, uh, DBRS, Dominion, DBRS, Dominion Bond Rating System, the Canadian one here. Yeah. Uh, what they do is they rate issues, they rate bond issues. M more than just companies, they rate bond issues. Uh, you have a certain bond issue, it's rated something. You have a different bond issue, it's rated something different. Why is that? Because not the same issues by the same, not all the issues by the same company are rated the same. Issues have what's called seniority. In the case of bankruptcy, some are paid before others. There's a bit like a lineup system. And the people who are first in the lineup, they are the ones who collect uh, their assets. And when their assets are fully paid, then you go to the next one. Okay, it's not like you share or something like that. That's why rating agencies, what they do is they rate, com they rate issues, not companies. They know such thing as the rating of uh, 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 General Motors. Depends what bond, right? Some bonds are rated higher, some bonds are rated lower. By the way, the same happens with the green bonds that we described last week. Not all bonds are, are the same color, okay? Some are green, some are brown. Depends what the financing is for. That's the first thing. The second thing is, who pays their rating agencies? They don't do it for free, right? Who pays? Who pays S&P? Who pays Moody's when they rate someone? Is it a commission? Hmm? They earn a commission on if they say lend based on credit rating. They earn a commission. Mm, I wouldn't call it a commission. A commission is usually a percentage of something. They have a flat rate, but also, the, it requires a commission. So I don't like, it's, it's not a commission. Um, but the question is who pays them? Who writes them a check? Who writes them a check? The company that is issuing the debt or the investors who buy the bonds? Or both? the company that issues the debt. Is that a conflict of interest? Is it a conflict of interest? Yes. Yes? Let me ask you a question. Who do you pay tuition fees to? The same company that gives you the degree. Is that a conflict of interest? No. Okay. They don't have to give you the degree. They don't have to give you the degree. Exactly. Um, and this is very important for universities like the University of Toronto, right? That's why we, we know we have to exercise our standards because our business is to exercise the standards. We don't want to give degrees to people who don't deserve them. Is the same thing is the same thing true for rating agencies? It's not the same? Well, um, so I'll tell you this is this is an interesting I, I don't want to answer this. I, I'll tell you what I think. I want you to know what I think, but this is it's just an opinion. It's not a fact anymore. It's an opinion. And it's, I think it's an important opinion, and I think you'll see why. Um, so first of all, I don't think it is a conflict of interest for uh, the university. I don't think it's a conflict of interest for the rating agencies either. <clears throat> for the same reason, which is that their rating is worth as much as their reputation is worth. These are things where your reputation matters, right? <clears throat> um, in a certain sense, these are the <laughs> um, th these are the influencers of 20 years ago. What they say matters, right? Um, as long as everybody knows, it's a matter of disclosure. Disclosure is what makes the whole thing true. You, I don't know if you follow any influencer. I have to say I'm mystified by them. I love them. Okay, I like to analyze them. I like to see what they say. I, 
I, I never believe anything they say, but I like to I like to look at what they say because it's it's a fantastic. It's not a new business model. It's been around for a long time, right? And what makes one? I mean, I don't know if you do. I, I don't know if you follow an influencer. I'm sure you do. I'm sure you do. Um, I I have my own influencers. They are dead, most of them, unfortunately. But I do have my influencers too. The conflict of interest is a very important topic. It was very important in 2008, as you said, right? In 2008, they were all accused of just um, uh, basically selling the ratings for corporations that ended up being not worth those ratings. Um, companies that defaulted with a AAA rating, actually not companies, issues. M many of them were, were structured credit instruments, okay? They got AAA rating and then they defaulted. Why? Because they follow a system to rate these bonds. And if you know the system, then you can create those instruments so that they get AAA rating. It's as if I know the exams that U of T gives for every degree, right? The, the questions are public, right? So you just go and you know the answers to the questions, you just do the exam, right? Of course, there are differences there. In the, in the, uh, in the, by the way, I firmly believe that um, universities are rating systems for people. I, re I firmly believe that, okay? Um, unlike S&P, uh, we try to make you better, okay? We try to improve your rating, uh, but we also exercise our rating criteria when uh, at the right time. And <clears throat> so, a lot, of, a lot has been said about the rating agencies and the value of their rating. I, I, it's important that you are aware of this and you are aware of the potential conflict of interest. I don't think there is. You may think there is. There's no real right answer. But it's important that you are aware of that, that the rating is given to the corporation that pays them hmm? with all of the consequences of that. All right, so that's as far as it goes for, for, for us. This is the rating uh, system uh, description. I think it's for S&P, Standard & Poor's, is one of the main ones. Hmm? Words, what does this mean? This means nothing. You have to go and see what, all of this has an algorithm behind, uh, behind the rating, right? They check your capitalization levels, they check this, they check that. And the people who know that, then they know how to, given a certain issue, how you can do things so that your rating is best possible. For example, we saw last week how you could take a bank, break it into half, two halves, and then each of them has a value at risk of zero. Saw that, right? Well, you could do something um, as follows. You have a particularly important bond issue. What you could do is, you could create an SPV, the SPV, a special purpose vehicle, SPV, the SPV, that company you create, is the one issuing the bond, and then you overcapitalize that firm so that the bond has a very good rating. Right? You can do that. Hmm? Of course, in funding that something else in your organization gets weaker, but that just doesn't issue bonds, therefore, has no credit rating. It's unrated, right? So you can you can uh, you can take advantage of this. You can engineer uh, ratings, and this is what happened in the decade that led to 2008, when all of this was. Uh, but in a certain sense, these companies, the rating agencies, were doing what they were supposed to do, right? They issued their opinion about these particulars. Just be aware of this. Be aware of this. For what is concerned for us is this is the an example of a of a uh, transition probability matrix given by Standard & Poor's. Now, I'll say one thing. Um, this matrix, I don't know from what year it is. I'm going to guess it where I did it in the year 2003. I don't know. Okay? All right. <clears throat> Do you think this matrix is the same today? No. Then, wait a minute, how do I say this is a Markov process if the matrix changes? What's a Markov chain? It's a process and the matrix is always the same. 
then something is wrong. I just told you this matrix is old. The matrix today is different. So is this not a Markov chain? Aha, it is a Markov chain. It's just that the Markov chain that you were taught where the probability, the, mat the tr transition probability matrix does not change, that is just an idealized view. In practice, they always change, right? Because, oh, it's, I think it's this, oh, no, no, I know it's not that, I, now I think it's that. What do you do? You stay with the one that you thought was the true probability matrix? So, this is, you have to distinguish between the calibration of the matrix and the model itself. The model is Markovian. It's a transition probability matrix. But the matrix could change just because we recognize that the matrix we have now is different from the one that we thought we had before. There's no inconsistency. This is what happens when you apply mathematical concepts in practice. Right? Because, well, sorry, this is the matrix I, I, I was using in 2003. Today I have to use the same one. No, it doesn't work like that. You model everything as if this is the matrix that you're going to have forever, but then when it's time to change, you change. And then everything changes, and then, well, just, just deal with it. That's how these things are applied in practice. So Markov processes are wonderful, but the way you apply them in practice are very dirty. Yes? In this, in this year, the, the default probability of triple A is 10% almost? Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, the real property of a of a double B is ten percent. Let's see. Uh, this is the default state, right? So here is significant, it's significant. right? So that's ten percent. Is that what you said? No. Uh, that's not what I said, but now I understand. Do you understand? Okay, good. Well, since you're looking at the numbers, let me, so that means, you know, if you're triple C, you're 20%, right? Big jump between triple B and double B. That's where Goodrich was, right? Yes. Yes, so the chance for triple C get into triple A is actually higher than uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, there is a number here that I wanted to point out to you. That's the number I wanted to point out to you. Which one is the one that you're talking about? That one? Yeah, okay. So what's with that number? It looks like that number is wrong, right? Is it because, is it because unrated, um, well, if you're unrated, you start at that, so you can go to it. Yeah, that's the reason. That's the reason. So first of all, does everybody understand that number? It looks like it's wrong. Why? Because it looks like you are more likely to become triple A if you are rated triple C than if you are rated B. Right? That looks weird. No. First of all, as you know, Markov chains, they don't have to be monotone in any way. Right? There's no reason for any number. The only thing is that they have to add up to one. That's the only thing. But there's no monotonicity. Right? And second, what would likely happen is companies that are just don't have enough history, the startup companies that issue bonds on the first year, they're rated triple C, the lowest possible rating, right? Then the next year, they're rated fantastic. Um, and the thing is that that's how you start. And that's why it looks like you are better than the, than the B, because the B already had their chance. They're not a startup anymore. So if you're rated B and you're not a startup, then you're probably less likely to become triple A anytime soon. It just happens. There's no, there's no contradiction here. That's how Markov chains work. Yes? Yeah, that's, that, that's the one number that requires explanation. The rest are kind of okay. I don't have an issue with them. All right. Um, maybe that one. Same thing, right? But anyway. <coughs> so this is real. And what we can do is we can adapt what we saw earlier to this reality. So let me go ahead and do it. Um, a transition probability matrix gives me the transition probabilities after, say, a year. I pick a period of a year. And then how do I do my two-year transition probabilities? 
Well, I have the, you may have seen this already. If, I, if in two years I want to know the probability of going from I to J, I can go through all of the possible intermediate states K, and because the probability is the same, probability I go from I to K next year and from K to J the year after, I multiply because there are conditional probabilities and, um, and, and I add them up. This happens to be exactly the definition of the product of two matrices. Yeah? So that means that the transition probability matrix after two steps is the square of the transition probability matrix after one step. You've seen that. How about the transition probability matrix after 10 years? A to the power 10, after 30 years. A to the power 30, right? Six months. A to the power one half, right? A to or a quarter would be A to the power one quarter. And I have a very important question to ask you. Do you know how to take the square root of a matrix? Damn it. I hate it when people don't explain linear algebra the right way. All right, so this is a high point of um, my class in credit risk. Make sure that you can take square roots of matrices. You can take square roots of numbers, yes? Yes? Actually, ha have you ever done the square root of a number? How, how do you do the square root of two? How, how did they show, how, have you actually done it by hand? Or you've used a calculator? You've done it by hand? you done it by hand? Yeah? How do you do it by hand? Approximation. Yes, that's, that's, that, that would be one way of doing that. You can, there's two ways of doing it by hand. Sorry, there's three ways. One is a very complicated way that they taught me when I was a little boy, which I remembered and I was good at it, but I said, well, what's the point of this, right? It's much faster to uh, use the and, and Newton's method. It's much, much faster, right? Uh, you know Newton's method, right? <coughs> you solve the x squared, you solve the equation x squared equals 2 with, with tangents, very fast, very fast. To give you a recursive algorithm is very fast. <coughs> or you can use Taylor series. You can uh, Taylor expand the square root function, right? Yeah. Of those three, what's your favorite? Do you have a favorite? Well, you know, oh, by the way, you know all these three methods of taking the square root of 2? You know all three methods? There's like an arithmetic mean, geometric mean method. I don't know that one. Okay. Um, but um, by the way, let me ask you a question. Um, how do you take the exponential of number two? E, e squared. How do you take the exponential of a number e to the power two? You multiply it by itself. E, right, you multiply e by itself, right? How do you take e to the power pi? Use the Taylor series. Taylor series, right? So I don't remember what they taught me in school when I was that type. Okay, um, I do remember the bisection method, which is the best for many of these. But Taylor series is the one that always works, right? And what's the thing with Taylor series? Can you apply a Taylor series to a matrix? Let's see, what does a Taylor series entail? Multiplication, right? You're raised to a power, yeah? And we're okay with that. You know how to take the power two and power 10, right? Yeah? You multiply by a number and you add. So you could do that with matrices also, right? Yeah? So why don't we use the Taylor expansion for the square root Exactly the same one that works for the number and apply to matrices. Can we do that? Right? Yeah, I'm sure they say they say package uh, on PyTorch that you can download and does it for you. But it's good to know how these things actually work. Right? So here you can take a to any power. By the way, I can take the exponential of a. I can take the sine of a 
I can take the logarithm of A, I can do anything I want of any analytic function as long as the matrix, the spectral radius is within the radius of convergence of my series, right? By the way, this is computational algebra, this is what you do. And I, a good chunk, there, there's two things which are very important when you study linear algebra, two. One is this, and the other one is eigenvalues and eigenvectors, and the rest is irrelevant. I mean, irrelevant is because it's a consequence of these two things. If you know how to do these two things, then you're good. And even this, the problem is that eigenvalues and eigenvectors, Markov, Markov matrices, Markov matrices don't have necessarily, uh, are not necessarily diagonalizable. That's the problem. That's we need something like this. Otherwise, you diagonalize and then you do all your operations in the diagonal matrix, right? You're with me, right? Yeah? Good. Um, so that's how you do computational algebra. So it's very important to be able to take the square root of a matrix. But now you can do it in at least two ways. You can write that yourself and write the Python code yourself or just download a package and they will do it for you. But there's no mysticism in doing this. It's just as complicated as doing the square root of two, the number two. The same Taylor series works, right? And it converges just as fast, by the way. Yeah? Okay, so at this point, at this point, I've reached the end of what I wanted to talk about today. Okay? But I want, I want you to be aware of where we are. We've climbed the mountain. I don't know if it looked very steep or not, but I want you to be aware of where we are. <coughs> we can deal with the S&P credit rating system eight states, 16 states, it doesn't matter. You just do this. Um, this type of multiplications are kind of easy to do because uh, these matrices are not huge, small, about 100 entries. So if this Taylor series, if this Taylor series converges in 10 steps, then you have to take a few thousand operations, it's no problem. This will allow you to calculate the probability of default of any one of these, um, under any one of these situations at any period of time that you want, six months, five years, whatever. By the way, this is what I advance you, this is what your assignment number two will be. Okay, so you will have to take square roots of matrices in your assignment number two. And maybe you have to uh, raise those matrices to the power one over 12. Big deal. Start looking for some Python code that does it for you, so you don't have to do it yourselves. That's my advice that you can do today, right? Yes, yeah? You understand what I'm saying, right? Okay, good. But now, um, so that's the practical aspect of this. So in principle, don't do it yet, but in principle, you could now calculate the priority of default of Bell Canada in the next week. A significant number, but you know how to do it. If you assume zero recovery, no problem. If you assume recovery rates, a bit more complicated. Yes? It's a bit circular because we're using these numbers in order to calculate the risk for these companies, but someone had to calculate the risk. Exactly, the and, exactly. and that's uh, and, uh, what, circular. I remind you of the fundamental theorem of asset pricing, right? That was circular. It says that if these are the market prices for all my instruments, then there's a unique price that prices anything else. We didn't question how the market arrived at those prices. We don't question why Apple is at 137 today. That's what the market is. That's how finance works, right? That circularity that you're referring to was the basis how we did pricing theory in this course. So we've been dealing with these circular arguments all the time. And the probabilities of default that we have embedded here are the ones which are the ones which uh, are given to us by the market. Okay, I end with one question, which is this: This is my transition probability matrix for the S&P credit rating system. 
what happens if I take this matrix and I raise it to bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger power? So I look at this matrix, you know, how would this matrix be 100 years from now? They all go down to zero eventually. Uh, sorry? If you wait long enough, everybody will. Everybody will be default, right. And you will see that in your assignment number two. You're gonna, I'm going to ask you to calculate the probability of default over time using different methods, okay? And you will see that you always end up converging to zero. Now, let me, ask, let me tell you one thing. You may have seen this already. Have you seen when you look at Markov chains, that every Markov process has an attractive state, has a state which is left invariant. You've seen that, right? And that happens to be the eigenvector with eigenvalue of one of the transition probability matrix, right? Yes? If someone says no, please tell me. It's very easy to explain this to you, okay? But if you don't want to say anything, Please look it up in the Wikipedia or somewhere, okay? Because this is, a, this, is, this is well known. So every Markov state has an attractive state. Every Markov chain has an attractive state. In this case, the attractive state is the default state, which, by the way, is very obviously the attractive one. Every Markov chain has a um, I, one as the eigenvector, as the eigenvalue, always because the fact that all of the columns or rows add up to one means that if you subtract the identity matrix, they all add up to zero, which means that the rows or columns are linearly dependent. Therefore, the determinant is zero. Therefore, one is always an eigenvalue of that matrix. Of that. Okay, I'm reminding you things. This is important when we're doing credit. It's just that in, except it's important even though the obvious attractive state is the one which is given to us by the default state, which is here. Okay? Great. Okay. Next week on Zoom. Okay? Next week on Zoom. Next week, what I will do is I will ignore what we've learned today, and I'm going to start from scratch. As you, as you will see, it'll, it'll look very different at the beginning. It will look very, very different at the beginning. I say, why, why, what am I talking about? It looks like it's a different theory. And then I will introduce to you the Merton model. And then we'll look even more weird. And then I advance you two miracles will happen in class next week. Be ready with your cameras to record them. Two miracles will happen. Completely unexpected, I think. And talking about circular, you know? At that point, we will see that the Earth is really round. That's happening to us next week. And I'll tell you one more thing. Because I'll be, I'll be on Zoom, and this is very, very important that I want to tell you in person. We saw the Black Souls theory. And the Black Souls theory, I told you, it is one of the pinnacles of uh, mathematical finance, uh, won the Nobel Prize to Merton and Scholz and this and that. And it's great, it's something which is used even today, even if it's only as a language, it's used. <clears throat> what is perhaps not very well known is why a Scholz and Merton were working on that. If you read the Nobel Prize speech by both of them, which are on the website, it's, it's worth the read, okay? Uh, you will see that they came at this from different perspectives. And they ended up giving very different solutions just because the way they think are different. Merton thinks one way and Scholz thinks different. I don't know Merton personally. I, um, I know Scholz very well. Uh, um, they think very differently. But Merton, did something which is of historical relevance, in my opinion, which is the Black Souls theory was done in 1973. And his famous credit risk paper was done in 1974. Because as we will see next week, he needed the Black Scholes Merton theory to do his Merton model. So it turns out that 
One of the theories that we'll develop next week is due to Merton, and it uses the Black-Scholes-Merton theory, and that is how we will be able to value companies and also introduce their probabilities of default and recovery rates and all of that. It's an incredibly amazing integrated model that has everything built into it. The credit risk, the prices, the bond prices, the interest rates and everything. That will be there. I hope it will become clear on Zoom. You will see that the formulas are there. They will be the rise. They will give rise to the two miracles that we'll see that next next week. Just be alert because I'll have you on the screen and it's difficult for me to say, wow, you know. But just, just be very well aware of that. Okay, that'll happen next week. After next week, I'll have uh, two lectures on investments and then one on communication skills. We have four more lectures to go, right? Am I right? Today and four more, right? Yeah, good. Okay, so then. And that will be the end of the course. So uh, today's mountain, I hope it gave you a different type of landscape from one, the, the one we saw last week. And I should tell you that I, pre I predict that if you work in the financial sector today, about half of you will be dealing with these types of things. And the other half, you'll be dealing with investments. So okay, the first part of the course, I think very few people will be dealing with that. All right, good. Um, we're finished. Good. Uh, that gives me time to clean up before the next class, and I'll see you on Zoom next week.